I'm Sister Simone Campbell. I'm a Sister of Social Service and the Executive Director of Network Lobby for Catholic Social Justice, based in Washington, D.C. So I'm a visitor from out of town. Mm. And we're very glad to have you here, Thank too. You. Yeah. I'm Sister Marceline Cook, a Springfield Dominican. I direct our Office of Justice. And so I do some work with Network and connect with them and what they are about as well. I'm here because we've been doing a series of rural roundtables mm -hmm. around the country uh, to listen to the experience of rural America. Because when we looked at the map, I say we, but when I looked at the map and saw where healthcare was in trouble, saw where the economy is in trouble, saw where there's aging population and declining population, saw where there is challenges with regards to public transit and issues of poverty, it's rural America. Mm -hmm. And I'm a city girl from California, so I know nothing about rural America. And I asked around at our office in D.C., and we were all city folk. So we said, we have to go learn something. We have to be able to enter into dialogue and understand the reality, because we say at Network that we're working for the benefit of the 100%. Well, if we don't understand the 100%, how can we work for it? So that's why we're on the road, is to hear the stories, get educated, to learn about the rural reality in our nation. And then some people might question, is Springfield rural? <laughs> it may not be rural, rural, like the town I grew up in. However, it's situated within rural communities, for sure. Yeah. And it's not highly urban like Chicago or some much larger yeah. cities. Can so I ask, where did you grow up? I grew up about an hour and 15 minutes west of here, in oh. Mount Sterling, Illinois. Wow. So I grew up on a farm. So, so, so you have that in your blood. In exactly. Your Although it, is, it has changed so much oh, sure. from, since, since I entered the convent. Right. I mean, our farm was 200 acres and we had, wow. we rotated crops at the time. We had all kinds of animals, whereas now everything is, is cash cropping. Soybeans or corn, and you see wheat once in a while, not too often. Yeah, yeah. And um, it's just done so differently. And well, so, when, when you say cash cropping, does that mean that th those are crops that you plant, harvest, and sell exactly. outside? Exactly. Because when, uh, well, farmers that still have cows, you know, like right. dairy cows or uh, uh, beef cattle, they plant hay fields. I mean, they have right, fields of hay right. so that they um, can cut, feed their cut and bale the hay, and then feed, they can feed the animals. But if you're cash cropping, you don't have any connection to any of that. You simply oh. plant the crop and do just exactly yeah. what you said. Um, so are, are we're they? losing some. In doing that, we lose some touch with earth and the soil and what it means. You know. Interesting. Huh. Yeah. Up in uh, one of our round tables in Amsterdam, New York, a dairy farmer was talking about how difficult dairy farming is these days because the return of the selling milk is at such low prices. It's, they can barely keep their herd, or and they were like a, almost a hundred thousand dollars in debt to be able to buy feed, and mm -hmm. that his commitment to the herd, he said, it but they were sort of like their family and that they couldn't conceive of doing something that would hurt the herd. And yet, they weren't able to pay the immigrant labor, the undocumented workers, enough. And the family didn't have enough either to really pay for anything. And the struggle of a dairy farmer was like palpable. I had no idea. I think Does that happen around here too? I don't know all the stories with yeah. it, but I'm guessing it does. I even heard from a staffer for my well, congressman talking about farmers in Iowa and farther west who can't get workers yeah. with this whole immigration piece. They can't yeah. get workers to work on their farms. And it's not because they'd be taking anybody else's job either. So oh. that's the. Yesterday, or day, day before yesterday at a round table in Iowa, uh, this one immigrant woman, uh, Maria, who's been here like 20 years, and she says, we don't come to take your jobs. Tell people we don't come to take your jobs. We come for the leftovers. You have a lot of leftovers. Aww. Oh, it broke my heart. I know, but... 
Minds, it reminds me of the woman in the gospel when Jesus oh, wouldn't give her anything. Yeah. And she says, even the dogs eat the leavings of the table. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that does. Mm. And it's wrong that we should deny them that. Mm. Oof. We come for the leftovers. I have to remember that one. Just about everything we've heard is not in the national conversation. Oh my glory. The challenge of these small farming communities around the country that support agriculture mm -hmm. and because it's becoming more and more uh, commercial farming. It's agribusiness. Agribusiness. Agribusiness would be the term. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, thank you. So, with agribusiness, they're less engaged or less connected to these small towns that have always supported the local farming. And that agribusiness then buys on a large scale, you know, can outsource and develop, but yet are not engaged at all in supporting the local community. In the local community, your, your farming community, you've got the, the dealers, I mean the tractor dealers, the parts dealers, those who repair machinery. Yeah. Yeah. You've got the banks that are loaning, the local farmers, and then you've got all the stores that just naturally help a community that if the farmers aren't there to buy into it or to buy from them, right. those people go under as well. That's so, you know, the, no the agribusiness either. is, um, I, sometimes it's defended because we need it to feed the world, but I just, um, there's this, the woman in India, Bandana Shiva. Yes, yes. And she talks about if you, realistically, it's the small farmer that feeds the world. It isn't agribusiness doing it. That's true. So. That's true. And then I was hearing, uh, where were we? I've been to a lot of places. So uh, it, it was in Iowa. They were talking about how these three brothers put their land together to farm 10,000 acres. And the reason they could do that volume is because of machines. Mm. And in Tutwiler, Mississippi, oh my glory, oh, I was blown away by this reality. Okay, it's the Mississippi Delta. Tutwiler yeah, is very poor. extremely poor. Yes. That they still call the farms owned by the white, oh, only white farmers own the farms, but they call them all plantations still. And the plantations need no workers other than the owner's family because everything's mechanized. Everything is mechanized. So it's totally undermined the economy of all the people, the descendants of the African-American slaves, that's undermined their whole uh, job situation. Mm -hmm. And so they end up with little or nothing. Little or nothing. It is, uh, I, was, I was blown away by it, but the other piece that blew me away was because this is accepted by everybody. At the end at the end of the round table it was all African Americans and me and two other sisters who have worked there forever mm -hmm. uh, who are white and uh, and we had a whole group of African American kids there from the high school. It was a great conversation but the high school superintendent was also there so they were sort of a little shy about what they <laughs> brought up you know. But um, at the end of it I, nobody had talked about race relations, so I, I brought it up. Mm -hmm. I said, well, well, what about relation, you know, the situation between white and black, and how is it for you all? And this 24-year-old said, well, she had never been in a mixed setting until, she was from Tutwiler, had her degree from the University of Mississippi. She'd never been in a mixed learning setting until she went to the university, and that People, uh, kids learn quickly where they can go and what they can say. And you know. Because if you're in a neighborhood that has sidewalks and no trash, you're in a white community. And if you're in a community without sidewalks and maybe some trash on the ground, you're in the black community. And you know where you are and you can feel safe in one, but not in the other. Mm -hmm. It was like, I, uh, chilling, chilling. What have we done as a nation?